John's rule of legal tech is that if you're doing something that only lawyers do, then by all means turn to legal tech for the solution. But if you're doing something that the rest of the business world does, then go use the tools that the rest of the business world uses. Lawson, the podcast for law firms, powered by Consult Webs. Welcome back to Lawson, the only podcast today that believes in the legal podcast of tomorrow. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest in legal marketing and law firm development. He's Paul Julius, and he never met a project he couldn't manage. And I'm Jake Sanders, and I never manage nothing. Paul, what's it like managing things? Sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's not. That's all I have to say about that. It's sort of like a box of chocolates and you you if you're as manager you could just decide to throw all the chocolates in the trash but you know what you should manage to do right now is tell everybody what's on the show i can manage that because today we're talking about project management first uh, with an article from agileattorney.com and then we're going to talk to the agile attorney himself john grant about lean sigma kanban legal tech marketing management and what it all means for the busy lawyer and then we get real answers to real questions with five questions we ask everyone pull up a plate it's the hot takes buffet the link today is from agileattorney.com it's written by john grant who just happens to be on our show Really? Mm-hmm. I, I planned it. I planned it this way. Uh, it, you it, managed to. I managed to plan it that way. Um, but I'm projecting. What's really happening is John listened to an earlier episode we had about project management and had some, some flavors. And his whole thing at Agile Attorney centers around the idea of purpose. And so this article today on the Hot Take Buffet is called Capturing Your Practice's Purpose, Um, because he doesn't go off at length about the manufacturing histories and this type of um, project management workflow versus, you know, this rubric. You know, he doesn't get very inside baseball. He spends a lot of time talking about the game itself and the mindset. And his whole thought is... If you can come from a purposeful place, everything up top from making your projects manage more better, your case management better, it'll just kind of fall into place. So that's the heart of this. I I, I selected it because it's essential to understanding what drives you through managing projects and solving problems. And I I just think John's words here are... um, you know, something that you need to kind of essentially understand before you get to this uh, more math, uh, more process, more system-based thinking. So I, I wanted to share it with everybody. I think it's good. You should read it. His words are worthy enough, and he, you know, brings them to life later on in the interview. But my hot take is, why is an important thing to get through all of your what? You know, what do you need to do? What needs to get done? If you know why, maybe you get it done easier or you do it stronger or, you know, you, you know, think in longer time frames. So I love this piece and I love John. And my hot take is that why is, why is, why is the, is, is the what you need? So I appreciate it. What did you think of this? So, uh, I really, really like what you're saying that you know, the why, the why will carry you through the what sometimes too. Right. Um, as, especially when running a business, a lot of times you have to figure out the what and the how. I right. don't know. How? Run into these things before. I've never done this. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we talked to John later, uh, particularly about like scalability and, and finding bottlenecks and stuff like that. That may be very unfamiliar and uncomfortable territory. But if you have that why, um, that's that's going to make that a little bit easier to deal mm-hmm. with and a little bit easier to to kind of look – um, sort of up from, from, from what you're doing and say, okay, this is why this needs to get done. Yeah. Cause you, cause you'll get lost. You'll be billing and, and you won't think, or, 
or you'll forget to send an invoice just because you were so f- filled up. But he, he goes in his piece, he says, you know, why did you go to law school? And he shares mm-hmm. some of his earliest memories, um, you know, and it's not just about money. Yeah. There's a line that he says when he, he was in law school, you know, if, uh, from one of the professors said, you know, if all you want to do is make money, the professor continued, you should leave this class, tell the registrar you're dropping out and go into title insurance. <laughs> so, so everybody laughs, but it's the truth. Yeah. You know, because even the money won't sustain you, no. <laughs> which it's is sad because you I mean, just want does. more of it. Well, and it's, it's, it'll stress you out. It's, there, there's a lot too, if there is no why. And that really um, kind of leads into what I took out of this and mm-hmm. something that I think John really elaborates on uh, brilliantly and very eloquently later on in his interview. Yeah. But he's talking about mission statements. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that really kind of is your why. If you, if you, if you make a good mission statement and he's talking about coming up with one here and he says the most common mistakes I see in law firm mission statements, um, which is the place where your purpose should be most evident is stuffing it full of platitudes. Sometimes these are things the firm leadership thinks their clients wants to hear. Mm. Other times they're the things they want to hear themselves. Uh, and Jake, this really struck with me because I know you and I have gone through this, uh, you know, not only for, for clients, but you know. Um, in different situations. Mm-hmm. And that is super, super common. And and really, yeah. you came up with what's the best way to answer that. And we were just talking about this um, before we even uh, went on, on the air was go ask your clients. Right. What is it? Don't don't guess what they want to hear. Don't tell them stuff that you think they should hear. Listen to them. Right. What are their pain points? You know, what is it that they need and how is it that, how is it that what you do, you know, aligns with that and helps them? What part of their life are you going to play? Yes. And well, there's Clayton Christensen's jobs to be done framework that Mm -hmm. he, he was in the Harvard, Harvard business review, big, big, um, conceptual idea that your, your work and job isn't what it is. It's the jobs that it helps your clients get done. Nice. So if your law service job helps them on the other side of the issue, that, that's what you're enabling them. Or it allows them to take care of something else in their life that is so to, totally unattached. And you wouldn't know any of this if you didn't ask. It's really interesting because John spends a lot of time dismissing what he says because he's very um, methodical and systematized when the way he, uh, you know, approaches problems, but he knows that there's this wildness to it, that there is this underpending spiritual thing that you need that will keep you, um, you know, focused when you get through the droll, you know, or you find yourself, you know, doing the math, you know, but why you need to get the why is because you can enable your potential, reduce your friction, foster prosperity, encourage exploration, kindle happiness. You know, he, it's amazing. He goes over this purpose wheel and he spends a lot of time dismissing his stuff as woo, but it's so essentially fundamental that you can have all the tech and tools, but if you don't have a purpose to use them, you just have a garage full of an easel of a treadmill, of a trombone, of, you know, a cello, of, you know, a pottery wheel, of a pizza kiln, of a bread machine, you know, all of these things that you could have learned to express yourself, but the tools don't get you there. Mm -mm. You know, you're just one loaf of bread through depression at that point, (laughs) because you don't have meaning. And, you know, everyone laughs or, you know, you think it's silly, but John's so serious about it. And what I love about him and what he gets in, in this blog, which is just excellent, is all of that is related to the idea of you enhancing and being prosperous through process management, you know, project management, all of this stuff is connected. I, I think part of it, part of why he's, he goes into the woo, um, but you know, saying this stuff is a little maybe spiritual or mm-hmm. because a lot of people will hear things like that and they start thinking about going on vision quests and their purpose 
in the grand scheme of the universe. Right. And peyote um, and, and yeah. I mean, yeah, well, speak for yourself. But, okay, you know, sorry. Whatever, whatever it brings to your mind, Jake. <laughs> whatever. Um, we'll talk later. Um, it, it, it's not necessarily that. It can tie into that. Right. Um, but your entire, you know, life's purpose, your your place in the universe, uh, all that stuff. I, I I guess it can feed off this, but you have to break it down into a more fundamental reason for your business's existence and for why you're going to go and engage uh, with other people and then ask them for money for what you did. That all ties into systematizing the way you can think, but coming Mm. from a soft place. So having hard tools and tactics, but a soft understanding that things are fungible and that they move around. Um, but, not going to find everything in a spreadsheet, you know, not all the time. Exactly right. Go check out the article, get into the ideas that John outlines, learn a little bit about Agile, and then stick around for an interview with the Agile attorney himself. Coming up on Lawson. Lawson continues, but first, a word from our sponsor. Since 1999, ConsultWebs has been helping law firms connect with clients on the web, connect digital marketing success with firm success, and connect their business goals to proven strategies that help them get the most out of their legal marketing. Go to ConsultWebs.com to learn more. John Grant is a fourth-generation lawyer and the founder of Agile Attorney, a law firm management consulting agency working with legal professionals in leadership roles to improve the capacity and productivity of their teams, develop metrics-based strategies that improve outcomes, and build scalable and resilient organizations. We discovered John through Jess Bergen and the magic of the internet, and now we bring that magic to you. John, welcome to Lawsome. Wow, I I love how you introduced me. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna keep that. That's great. <laughs> That's Thank it. You. Frame it. It's in your hall. You take it. You had some thoughts when you heard our previous episode on project management, Six Sigma Agile, which is a new world for us. And your company, Agile Attorney, you you're working with law firms, dealing with project management. What what is the mission, like your elevator pitch for Agile Attorney, and what's your focus over there? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll start with my mission, right? Yes. And, and it's, uh, I, I feel like I've got it pretty well nailed. And it's my mission is to help legal professionals harness the tools of modern entrepreneurship to build practices that are profitable, scalable, and sustainable for themselves and for their communities. Um, so that's my, that's my mission statement. There's a lot to unpack in there. Um, my elevator pitch is I help lawyers suck less. Um, and, and that's a really good filter because if someone that, um, could possibly use my help takes offense at that statement, then right. We're not going to work well together. So that's, that's a really good screening thing. Oh, I love it. Um, and it's not that lawyers suck, but as you said, like I'm a fourth generation lawyer, I grew up, I am steeped in sort of the tradition and um, you know, my very first job was working in my uncle's law firm, like updating pocket parts back in the late eighties. Mm. Um, thank God that's a thing I don't think we have to worry about anymore. Mm. Um, I did a bunch of like scanning and digitization stuff for my stepdad, uh, in his law office when I was in high school. I mean, I've, I've been like in literally in the bowels of uh, many different <laughs> law practices, a lot of them, my family's and, um, it's great, right? I'm I'm a true believer, right? There's there's amazing stuff that lawyers do in the world and they play such an important role, but we we have also harnessed ourselves to like so much history and frankly BS. I mean, again, I'm a fourth generation lawyer. My great grandfather was a bigwig. He was an ABA president. He was Howard Hughes attorney. He was Walt Disney's attorney. Like he mattered. He chaired a Senate commission. But a lot of the stuff and a lot of the way he practiced was, was I don't know, I, mean, it, I guess it worked well for his clients at the time, but it doesn't translate um, 
to today. And, yeah. and, you know, there's just a lot of stuff that lawyers carry along as sort of vestiges of these forgotten times that mm. we do not because we've intentionally do them, uh, but because we as a profession have always done them that way. Mm. And it's interesting because alongside this, we've always done it this way, is the real truth that humans and their behaviors don't change a lot. Everyone says tech has changed everything. Tech has revolutionized everything. And yet right. it somehow hasn't because we ha our behaviors haven't quite adapted to the new tech. And so when you talk about project management and mindsets and, and helping law firms become more effective, what do you think lawyers could be doing here? I mean, is, is there always going to be an agile project management solution or is tech <laughs> the answer or should they be coding? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, we pluck this string a lot on this show, but that seems yeah. to be the trendiest way to solve problems is just get the tech involved because we're well, changed. Me, and Yeah. Yeah. No, let, let me start with the agile thing, which I will say, so I am a believer in the agile methodology and I won't go into the history, but um, you know, it sort of developed in the early, late uh, 1990s, early 2000s in the software industry. And, and part of what I like about Agile for lawyers is that Agile is sort of a set of tools and philosophies that got its genesis in a knowledge worker environment. And that makes it different from Lean and Six Sigma and some other things, which, which all sort of were born in primarily the manufacturing world, which is very visual and, and physical, right? A knowledge work is not that. So I do believe in the Agile methodologies. That said, one of the big reasons I picked Agile Attorney as my brand name is because of the alliteration, right? And I think the lean lawyer was already taken. <laughs> so um, it's, it's not, there's not magic in any one of these philosophies. And I think you know, part of what I bristled at um, in your earlier project management show was it started to sound a little dogmatic around uh, project management or Six Sigma or all the rest. And, and that's where I have this take that all of these things are essentially distillations of human wisdom and knowledge passed down through the ages, right? There are examples of project management in the Bible. Uh, I listened to a cool podcast episode the other day that uh, was talking about quality assurance principles as set forth by Galileo, right? These are not new things. Part of the reason that we have to keep passing these wisdoms down is that they're not necessarily intuitive, right? We have to keep learning them. And, um, you know, lean, agile, uh, design thinking, jobs to be done, lean startup, all these things that I like to deal in. I try not to get too dogmatic about any one of them because what works in one organization or in one industry or in one practice group, even within the same law firm, might not work well in a different practice group or a different team or a different mm. part of the thing. So you, mm. you have to sort of understand the philosophies and, um, you know, e even the mindsets, right, without trying to get too woo-woo about it. Right. Um, and then be able to sort of pluck different things out of your toolbox to apply to different situations. And so a lot of what I've done is try to really build up my toolbox and be able to have a lot of different things that I can draw from and hopefully be able to pull out the right tool for the job for whatever customer or client I'm working with. So, so here's my question. You, you help people scale up. Everyone talks about scaling. Well, it's good you can do this. Now scale it. I like this yeah. cupcake. Can you make 400 of them? You know, and don't it. talk to me until you can scaling. do that. Well, so scaling is interesting because what you just said was that there is, a, there is an anti-dogmatism that might not say that this might work for you or might work for this situation. As scale goes up, so does the complication and the, entro and the ent entropy. You know what I mean? Yeah, so sure. yep. how, so, but you're saying as you're scaling up, your tool belt gets bigger or what, what, just kind of help me unpack the idea of there's no one way. Here's how we're going to scale it up times 400. Yeah, so it's funny. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep answering your most recent question by trying to answer the last one you asked, which is Fine. what's the role? Common, <laughs> common role? with you lawyers. No, you it, do this a lot. I no, I think it ties in. Uh, it's not. Uh, <laughs> trust me, I'm not. I'm not trying to like. Uh, I don't know. Uh, mind bend here. You've done it. I'm um, bent. I'm bent. 
So you asked about the role of technology, right? right. And, and most people think of, of technology as being the essential component in scale mm -hmm. right now. And you know, no doubt, technology can help you scale, but it can't be the first place you go. And so, you know, sort of one of the, uh, th there's a lot of phrases that I uh, seem to repeat often. And, and one of them is that real improvement comes from working with people, process, and tools, roughly in that order. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you talk about scaling up a practice, the, the first thing that you got to figure out is what the heck do you do? And, and I, again, this is getting a little woo, but like, what are the types of problems that your clients have? And what are your solutions to those problems that you can deliver in a consistent and repeatable way? Now, that's not to say that you're, you know, stamping out widgets on a factory line, because it's not that. Mm. But even the most complicated law practice still is going to follow the Pareto principle, right? 80% of the stuff that you do is going to be pretty routine. And what I try to help people do is really nail that routine stuff so that in the, you know, depending on your practice area, five to 20% or maybe 25% that really is, um, you know, requires sort of your deep knowledge and research and expertise and creativity that you have the time and the capacity in your practice to do that. So I talk a lot with my clients about, you, we, you have to figure out how much of your work is sheet music and how much of it is jazz, right? And the sheet music you wanna put on that player piano roll and turn up the tempo and get it just humming so that when it comes to your, uh, your ability to do a wicked solo, you've got the time and the space and the breathing room to do that. So, I mean, I guess getting a little bit more into the, the, the practice itself and maybe a little more into to nuts and bolts and tech and stuff like that. Um, we were recently at the ABA tech show and there was a really good amount of case management software companies uh, just walk, you know, when I was walking around the exhibitor hall, which, on one hand, seems really encouraging um, that, that there are these, you know, people are putting money into SaaS for, for law firms and stuff. But on the other hand, you know, the, the first thing you see when you walk down the stairs into that exhibit hall is Clio. They take up the whole thing. And then you walk around and see all this other stuff. So, I mean, is there really a need for so many different flavors of, of the same item? Yeah, well, so, you know, a, a, a few thoughts on that. I mean, number one, I try to make it a policy not to begrudge anyone their successful business model. So, you know, j just because I don't get it doesn't mean that there's not a model there. Hmm. Um, and there is, you know, there's a ton of stuff. I, um, I, I used to have a rule of thumb back when I was practicing, uh, and I had a, an, an IP, mostly IP copyright trademark practice that was basically you know, John's rule of legal tech is that if you're doing something that only lawyers do, then by all means, turn to legal tech for the solution. But if you're doing something that the rest of the business world does, then go use the tools that the rest of the business world uses. Um, and, you know, back at the time, I built my practice uh, around a project management tool called Basecamp. Mm -hmm. uh, and oh, had yeah. A, yeah. an accompanying CRM called High Rise. Sure. Uh, and I ran my practice using those two tools. Um, I didn't have any, you know, uh, um, legal tech almost at all in my in my practice. Um, now I will say that since that time, um, sort of the the old guard of online matter management law practice management tools have gotten a lot better. Right. So, I mean, I started my practice the same year that both Clio and Rocket Matter launched their products. And, you know, for me, I came out of the tech industry. Right. I spent 10 years um, sort of in the, the technology world. Those tools weren't capable yet of doing the kinds of things that I wanted to do with my law practice. So I wasn't able to use effectively use Clio at the time. Basecamp was way better for me. Um, since that time, those tools have gotten way better. Uh, I really. Um, I've actually become a Clio user uh, kind of tangentially lately because um, there's a nonprofit law firm that I'm on the board of and uh, we recently converted to Clio and I helped out a lot with that. So, um, you know, I, I've gotten really good with Clio. Uh, I also know, you know, I'm especially excited, right? Because of the agile project management and the lean stuff and 
I know that that Larry Port and Rocket Matter announced at Tech Show that they've got Kanban boards now. I haven't used it yet. Hmm. Uh, I can't wait to go kick their tires. I think Kanban's a great system, um, a great methodology for managing work, uh, especially knowledge work. Uh, so I'm curious to see what they've built. Um, but your question was sort of around the proliferation, mm -hmm. uh, proliferation. Let me say that. Right I now. guess. Yeah. I mean, like, are we just are, are we just kind of moving money around from here to there? Or is there something, you know, like like how different? I, and I see what you're saying mm -hmm. about not wanting to, you know, attack someone. I mean, you know, obviously, uh, it, you know, it, it's very um, encouraging to see all these different companies there. But I, I'm just right. wondering if there's going to be, you know, like what kind of market share are we talking about? What What problems are we solving? Yeah, well, so that's it, right? And so one of the things, right, for this nonprofit law firm that I'm on the board of, Clio helped us solve trust accounting problems, full stop. It is worth every bit of investment that we made because we weren't uh, to the point where we were having trust accounting problems yet, but I sure looked like that was on the horizon. And um, moving to Clio and being able to set up matters and get client-based uh, trust accounting fixed and Clio just solves it. It just like totally has it dialed in. You don't have to worry about it. And I love Clio for that, if nothing else. Now, there are other things like I'm super impressed with um, the level of help and support and knowledge management, knowledge based stuff that Clio has. So I, I really think Clio is doing some great stuff. Um, you know, back when I was in the tech world, one of the things I learned about um, evaluating technology is you have to evaluate both the company and the tool. Hmm. Uh, and I think it's really easy to say, oh yeah, this tool is really cool. I want it. Um, but especially as your business grows and you're, you know, you're putting a lot of eggs in that basket. And so one of the things that does worry me about all of the variations uh, of different, you know, legal tech, not just, not just practice management, mm -hmm. but all sorts of legal tech mm -hmm. is what's their, you know, 18 to you know 60 month viability look like um you know are we actually going to do a bunch of work putting our practice on a a, a product that's not going to exist so i think that's something that lawyers should be paying more attention to um backing up one step further and and this is kind of again gets into the difference between process and tools. I think it's really easy for people, right? Everybody wants a magic pill, magic bullet, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it's easy for technology to market itself as a magic pill. Um, and really, partly what they're saying is you don't have to worry about fixing your process, fixing your workflows, because we've done it for you. Right, just follow the workflow that our tool imagines. Oh boy, um, and you'll be fine. And I actually think in some situations, right, Filevine comes to mind. Right, Filevine hmm. is a great tool for um, personal injury lawyers because it really has sort of taken the flow of a personal injury case and systematized it. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of forces Filevine users, as I understand it, and it's been a while since I've seen the tool. Um, but it basically puts Filevine users into a workflow that makes sense for personal injury lawyers, right? And it organizes mm. in a way that really, regardless of what you think your process should be, Filevine probably has a better idea of what your process should be than you do, especially if you're just starting out. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting point that I think most people don't um, know. And such a confused landscape with all the entrants um, it's hard to tell who's going to be here because the marketing vibe could be so strong. Um, right. And so, I, I mean, this being a marketing show, you, you told us in, yeah. a, in, in an email that most lawyers don't actually need more marketing or better SEO. In fact, many of them are throwing <laughs> their marketing spend down the drain, which was yeah. interesting to I us. I threw down the gauntlet. Well, no, it's interesting. I want to know why why you're saying that, and and how what personal experiences have you seen? Because marketing is very at once, it's very powerful because it can yeah. pull the wool over your eyes. But if you know that there's wool over your eyes, you just have a stupid hat on your head. It, it's <laughs> it really feels like marketing at once is brainwashed, but that it doesn't work. So, like, talk to me about marketing and and how lawyers are wasting money because we're all ears. Yeah. Okay. Well, so um, I, I should clarify by saying, number one, marketing works. 
And when I say that most lawyers don't need more marketing or better SEO, what I'm really saying is they don't need more leads. Mm. Um, and so, and, and this actually comes into, um, again, another one of my sort of favorite concepts, and it comes originally out of lean, uh, and it's called the theory of constraints, but it's, it's better known as uh, bottleneck theory. And what bottleneck theory says is that in any complex workflow, right, more, more than, let's say, three stages, uh, there is always one part of the workflow that is the bottleneck that constrains the flow of the entire system. And if you think about it, it's really just another way of saying every chain has a weakest link, right? So whatever your complex system is, right? If it's, if it's your doing the work workflow for your law firm, uh, it probably starts at intake and it goes into an initial sort of research or back and forth with the client. Uh, and then there's a drafting phase and then there's a quality assurance phase. And then there's a, you know, maybe a redrafting or something and then an execution or a, a, an agreement phase. And then there's a closeout phase, right? But at any time in your practice, one of those phases is actually the, the sort of stickiest wicket where work is not flowing through your system. Uh, if you accept that is true, right? This, this idea that every chain has a weakest link, uh, there are two corollaries that also have to be true. Uh, number one is that if you can improve the flow of work at your bottleneck, then you will improve the flow of your entire system. And that's the half of it that people actually, you know, usually will nod their heads and, and it makes pretty good intuitive sense. The other corollary is harder, which is any improvement you make to part of your system that isn't your bottleneck won't help and it might actually hurt. Mm. And so if you think again in this sort of multi-stage workflow, if you improve a part of your system that is downstream of the bottleneck, it won't matter because stuff is just getting stuck at that bottleneck phase, whatever it happens to be, right? In the lean world, it's really easy to tell because physical inventory starts to pile up on the factory floor. Um, in a knowledge work environment, it's a lot harder because you don't actually see the work, uh, which again, is part of what I like Kanban boards for because they make that work visible. Uh, if you try to fix something that is upstream of your bottleneck, that's where you can run into real trouble because you wind up opening up the flow that puts even more pressure on your bottleneck. And so when I say that most lawyers don't actually need more marketing, it's because marketing and lead generation is usually at the front end of their three high-level workflows. So I, I boil it down to there's your getting the work system, there's your doing the work system, and there's your getting paid system. Right. And I know, yeah, I think the most recent one of your episodes that I listened to uh, had to do with the getting paid system. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, that's crucially important. I mean, obviously, you need to get paid. Um, there are also some really relatively, as I think uh, uh, your guest talked about, uh, r relatively simple things that you can do, even though most lawyers don't or a lot of lawyers don't, to sort of unlock that getting paid workflow. I tend to think that most of the tension in a law practice exists somewhere between the getting the work system or the doing the work system. But if your bottleneck is in the doing the work system, and I've seen this, so you asked for, for a real world example. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I, worked, I worked with an immigration lawyer. Uh, this was several years ago. She was one of my very first sort of clients. I, fr frankly, I was kind of beta testing a lot of my ideas on her. And um, I was at her office and we were talking about things. And you know, she kept saying, I, I actually asked her the question, like, what's the thing that's preventing you from making more money? And she said, oh, it's my marketing. I got to be doing my marketing. I got to get a billboard. I got to fix my website. I got to do this. I got to do that. And then as I was there, I was with her for a day and a half. So as I'm there in her office and we're talking about different things, the phone is ringing a ton. And she was a true solo at the time. She, she had you know, voicemail, but not an, an answering service. And I kept saying, you know, do you need to answer that? And she's like, oh, no, it's probably just another potential client. I'll, I'll deal with them when I have time. <laughs> And I'm like, you're, you're literally sabotaging whatever marketing you're doing, right? Yep. Because you're so busy and, and you're, you're, you know, basically what she knew, at least at sort of an instinctual level, is that she was so slammed in her doing the work workflow that she couldn't possibly imagine taking on even more work and shoving more sort of sausage into that casing, right? Yeah, man. Well, I, and it's... I, 
you know, earlier on, you know, we talked about uh, scalability and, and that's kind of, I think that's kind of a weird concept, particularly for people in, you know, kind of a service um, based, you know, business. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very difficult to step back from being the lawyer who's, who's handling the matters to being the business owner who, who is looking at, who can talk about things like system and scalability, because right. it's an odd question. If you are a solo or a small firm, how do I scale myself? Like I can't clone mm -hmm. myself. So <laughs> I think that's kind of what we're touching on here is, you know, how, yeah. how, how do we find these systems that allow us to, you know, um, have more marketing and, 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 and be able to handle those more clients um, yeah. and, and let me go be the lawyer, you know? Right. Well, so there's a few different things that, that come to mind. I mean, one, you know, we talked at the very beginning about, about Six Sigma and about it being a quality assurance um, uh, process, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do, I love quality. And, and one of the things that I've come to understand about all these different tool sets that I work with is that people come to me for process improvement, but what I actually wind up helping them with is quality improvement. And the reason why is that quality improvement and process improvement are actually the same thing, right? If you can improve uh, your definition of quality and you can basically build uh, systems and use tools and have practices that will deliver your quality uh, consistently and regularly, then that will necessarily allow you to start to speed up that part of the delivery. Uh, and I've kind of got, I, I won't go through it all, but there's this sort of multi-step model where you start with defining quality and then that moves to standardizing your work around that quality standard that you just defined. Um, when you standardize, you get more consistent. When you get more consistent, you can start to do some load balancing and you can put stuff off of your plate. Uh, onto somebody else's because you know they're going to deliver in a consistent way. And it just sort of cascades from there and gets you to greater efficiency in your practice. Oh, um, man. Yeah. Oh and, and on top of it, you, you solve a lot of problems by having these quality things in place. Like if you work back and make totally. sure that your clients have a consistent, excellent experience, you're not chasing your tail, you know, oh, I got to follow up on this guy because I didn't answer his call yesterday. And, oh, and to that other point is that if you get lost in dashboard and you're looking at retention rates or NPS <laughs> scores or percentages or out the doors or in and outs, and you're looking at all these numbers, you'll miss the fact that the quality comes yeah. from uh, making adjustments to the process. Oh, yeah. geez, John. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, bro? Do, yeah. do you have people just <laughs> knocking down your door, like just like attacking you for this information? Or I like, <laughs> I feel like a Beatles like mania. There's like a. <laughs> well, I'm 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 working on it. I'm working on it. I'm try, <laughs> trying to trying to get my own marketing in place. No, so that's it. No, it's a process thing. Talking. It's a, yeah, yeah. Keep um, it up. Keep it up. Yeah, right. Well, and and you know, here's the thing with quality control, and you know, and and I will say, and lawyers, it's really not just lawyers. It's almost any profession. Mm, sure. Um, but most lawyers' quality standard is I know it when I see it. Right. I'm trained. I've I've researched. I've practiced. I've done all this. I know what quality looks like. Just I'll do it because I know what quality looks like. And the problem with that, of course, is that you have to do it. So if you can't actually like get it out of your head and onto paper, right? I've got I've got uh, small kids who are into Harry Potter right now. It's like it's like pulling that that you know memory thread out of Dumbledore's head and putting it in that weird bowl and yes. like you know putting your right. face into it. However that yeah. works. Um, <laughs> exactly like right, that. but. But you've got to get it out of your head and you've got to get it so that other people can do it, right? The other problem is when you don't actually write down your definition of quality, then your version of quality review is, well, I guess I'll read it a fifth time to make sure I didn't miss anything on the first four. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right. And you yeah, laugh, but I know no. there are lawyers listening to this going, oh, God, that's what I yep. do. No, I hear you. I hear you. I agree. I, you know, it, it, it's funny that one big theme uh, and, and Jack at Clio was talking about this a lot is, you know, the, designing around the client experience. Um, and, totally. you know, like like we were talking, it might seem a little woo woo. Uh, I had a manager 
sit down with me and help me work through when, when we started this new team here. Um, he said, write down, what do you think the client, a new client experience, what should they have? I want you to write it out from the moment you onboard them all the way through like monthly, monthly meetings, uh, how many touch points per month. And, and literally like, it was like a three page document of just yeah. this whole thing. And then go back, plan out everything. What could be a problem here? What could be a problem there? It was, uh, it, it took days. I mean, it was incredibly intensive, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, when it was done and we put that in there and we started to be able to look at this from a bigger thing, it was a huge relief because everybody could go back and look at this and say, Hey, here's how this works. Um, right. here's our reference point. If something's not working, we can go back and see exactly where that is and address it. So, I, I mean, I'm a, I, I love what you're saying about quality control and how it just can affect it, it's, it's more than just like, was this good? Yes. No, I don't know. I'll know it if I see it. There's yeah. a lot more to it, man. Seriously. Yeah. It's all about totally. gut. It's all about gut reactions and sort of trusting yeah. your gut, but then like, oh my gosh, don't listen to your your tummy. Well, here, so, <laughs> so, so well, no. And I like that too, but but you know, one of the so so I think I mentioned briefly lean startup methodology. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and one of the things I like about lean startup is that it puts a ton of emphasis on validating assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. So go with your gut, that's fine, but then validate it, right? Make sure that your gut is right. And you know, the the hardest part about validating assumptions is recognizing when you've made one. Mm -hmm. And that's the key that I think a lot of lawyers fall into, right? I mean, there's this funny, uh, I mean, I see this all the time, right? That we're, we're trained to be good issue spotters in law school, right? And, you know, a lot of the way that lawyers interact with clients and, you know, by no means all, but I've seen this so many times where you know, a client will start to sort of um, tell their story. And by the time the lawyer recognizes the third fact in the fact pattern, their brain is going like, shh, quiet, quiet now, just shut up so that I can do my law to you. Right. <laughs> and, and they're not like, they're not engaging with the whole person, right? They're engaging with this particular, you know, I have a hammer, you've got a nail type problem, or you look like a nail type problem. <laughs> um, and I'm hammered. It, right. Yep. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there, 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 oh God, that, that's a whole different set of issues. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So yeah, it, it is. And the other thing, right, that I love about you doing this sort of customer journey mapping, mm. um, and, and I hear this again all the time, and you probably do too, it's so uh, hard when you're a busy, especially small firm lawyer, uh, it's really easy to get to a place where it's like, oh my God, I can't install these smoke detectors because I'm too busy fighting the fire. Yeah, well <laughs> right? said. Yeah, yeah. And and what you're talking about, I mean, three days, that's a heck of a long time. I mean, and, and when I do my workshops with new clients, I like to take two. Yeah. Um, and I know better than to think that I can get a full two days out of people, right? So we go from like, <laughs> from like 10 to three, and we call that a day, right? Um, because they got to go do stuff. And I, yeah. and I get that practices are busy. Um, but you have to take time to step back and like, do that big picture thinking. And, and, you know, Again, it all sounds hokey, but the hokey stuff is true, right? The Simon Sinek, start with why, right? You have to know your why. You have to know your customer's why. Mm -hmm. Like, how do they interact with each other? Um, why should you care? I mean, yeah, you want to make money. And, you know, I, if, to, to the extent that I had beefs with the, um, the getting paid episode that I just listened to mm -hmm. from you guys, like, yeah, it's about the money, but it also has to be about your passion, right? It mm. has to be about your values. Mm. Um, and you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot, and, and this gets into like some really nerdy reading that I did several years ago, uh, there's this book called Toward an Anthropological Theory of Value uh, mm. that I read. I like it. And I frankly couldn't get through the whole thing. It was too dense. But at the very beginning, there was this really interesting discussion where he says, you know, there's a reason that in a lot of languages, we use the same word to describe economic value as we do to describe our personal and societal values. Hmm. And right, so if you want to achieve a, a, a relationship with somebody else where you feel like you're exchanging economic value in a way that is mutually beneficial, then you also have to connect your values and their values. And that's where you're both gonna feel like you're, you're getting you know, a, a good exchange out of that relationship. Oh my gosh. 
I really, really like that. That's um, so. Th there's a reason anthropologically that underpins the reason we behave certain ways, altruism, or you know, s certain um, things like that. But okay, so here's 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 the point, John. You have one thing to tell the JD on the street about all of this that we've just covered. What, what, what do you think would be the one piece from John Grant of advice for, for making their marketing or improving their, their, the management of their firm or getting their process together? I mean, is it this hokiness? Is it, do they need to pick up a book on anthropology or what's the one piece? <laughs> I would not recommend the book. On okay. On yeah. Anthropology. Okay. Put it, put it to the side. Um, uh, you know, in fact, if anything, I would say go read, uh, you know, uh, Siddhartha or mm. <laughs> something like a that. A good one. But again, that's that's yeah. getting woo. Um, you know, I, I think, and, and this is the kick I've been on lately. Uh, so if you ask me in a year, I might have a different answer. But uh, the one thing that any lawyer, legal professional can do that will fix, not fix, right, that will improve both their marketing and their workflows is to draft a real mission statement for yourself, right? Whether that's personal, whether it's for your firm, whether it's for your team, but draft a mission statement that talks about what you actually believe and why, right? Why do you do what you do? And I, I you know, I can tie mine, right? I, I, I rattled off mine at the beginning of the show. My why is that I want to try to fix the access to justice gap. So I've got this almost Pollyanna-ish vision where if I can help more lawyers improve the efficiency of their law practices, that will create capacity within those practices to do more work for more people. And if I can touch enough different law practices and improve their capacity to do more work for more people, then that will improve the access to justice situation by allowing more people to get legal help before. Right? That's my why. And, you know, it's tied into some weird family issues, too, right, as you probably could reflect. On. <laughs> Aren't uh, they all? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, there's a Freudian. Just stuff, lay down on this not... couch here for us, John. <laughs> yeah. right, right, right. Um, no, that's that's my why. So, you know, I, I just did actually, uh, you know, during tech show, which is probably a mistake, but I just did a webinar about how to craft a purpose driven mission statement hmm. uh, for yourself or your practice. Um, if you go to agileattorney.com, there's links in there somewhere. Uh, I'll try to make it more prominent to to do that replay. Um, but I really do think that that finding a mission statement that truly connects not with what you do, not with how you do it, um, but connects with that why, right? And it can't just be because I want to make a lot of money because that's not going to rally your community around you, right? It's important. The money is important. And, and it should definitely be a goal of your practice, right? But it can't be your mission. Um, Right, that gets into Gordon Gecko type stuff, and and I, you know, I I I think most people agree that that's probably not the extreme we want to go to. John, people want to learn more about you. They want to find you on the internet. They want to get agile. They want to lean in. How can they find you on the internet? Yes, uh, agileattorney.com, which I plugged already. Um, I I will say, you know, one of the things that I had always envisioned for doing what I do was to try to make it more of a community and more of a network. Uh, I kind of have struggled, uh, partly because I've been trying to handle a lot of my own tech work. Um, I now have a wonderful uh, person who's helping me on my website, um, who she and I connect with our wise together. It, it actually does, uh, it, again, as woo as it sounds, part, part of why um, she was interested in working with me was that she had gone through a divorce and hated her lawyer. And she's like, oh my God, I wish my lawyer had found you uh, before I did, wow. <laughs> or before I found that lawyer. <laughs> oh my Man. gosh. Uh, and so like, she's super passionate about helping me out. And the upshot of that is we're very, very close to being able to sort of relaunch the site as a network. So if you go to agileattorney.com backslash network, uh, you know, there's a coming soon page, uh, you can sign up and you can be uh, among the first to get in once we get it live. Uh, there will definitely be a free tier. So you'll be able to, to jump on the message boards, communicate with me, get some of my materials and resources completely free. Uh, and then obviously there's you know, going to be consulting and classes and some other stuff that, uh, that I will uh, sell as well because I got to make my living. Five questions we ask everyone. Number one. Okay. What was the last book you read? 
Uh, so I'm one of those people that always has multiple books going at a time, but um, I read How to Be an Anti-Racist uh, by Ibram X. Kendi, uh, mm. which is amazing. Uh, and on the fiction side, I read Circe by Madeline Miller. All right. Uh, number two, what is your favorite place? <laughs> my favorite place is probably the front seat of my cousin's drift boat uh, floating down the Madison River in Montana in the summertime. I actually good. like just pictured that the way That's you described great. it. It, oh, sounds amazing. it is my favorite place. Yeah, nice. it's, it's nice. amazing. Uh, okay, number three, what sites, blogs, newsletters, or podcasts do you regularly check in with? Boy, I follow the Harvard Business Review really closely. Um, there's just a ton of stuff in there that I can use and sort of reflect and, and translate for my clients. Uh, I, I read almost everything Bob Ambrosi puts out. Um, I, I think he's really got his finger on the pulse. Mm -hmm. um, and then I try to keep on top of the work coming out of the Isles Institute in Denver, which is the, the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System. Uh, they're doing some really cool stuff um, as far as like regulatory reform and just thinking out of the box um, about how to make the entire legal system better and not just sort of solve little piecemeal problems. Nice. All right. The one everybody wants to know. If you were stranded on a desert island and can only pick one condiment to take with you, what would it be? Oh. Um, boy, I love to cook. The thing that I reach for probably more than anything else, although it's more for my snacking than my cooking, uh, is Slap Your Mama seasoning blend. Nice. You know that stuff? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's yeah. It's so good. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, yeah. I, you excellent. know, I discovered that in, in New Orleans, I think I was visiting Ernie the attorney uh, for something. And, uh, and then I came back and, and there was a great little Asian grocery store in Portland that like had it sitting on the register. I'm like, oh, if this stuff out of you know, like Creole seasoning out of Louisiana has hit the Asian stores in Portland, then it's got to be good. Nice. Yeah. 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 That stuff's intense. Uh, okay. <laughs> Number five. After a long day or a long week at work, how do you relax and unwind? Boy, um, so this is not going to sound relaxing at all to most people, but I coach both of my kids' soccer teams and have for about seven years now. Uh, they're now 10 and 13, and I love it. I love coaching those kids. I love working with them. Um, it's so sort of gratifying to like, you know, for me at least, and I think for a lot of coaches, right? It's really, it's learning life lessons through the lens of sports, and it's, you know, the, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, all of it, like the importance of teamwork, um, it totally charges my batteries. You know, not to mention, I probably learned a lot about coaching lawyers from uh, coaching nine-year-olds on a soccer field. <laughs> For show notes, links, and info, go to thelawsonpodcast.com or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Be sure to leave us a review and rating in iTunes or wherever you find the you listen to. Until next week, stay Lawson. Awesome.